Am I on? You can hear me, right? It is so good to be here uh, with you this morning. Uh, first of all, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Seth Postel. I actually lived in Port Charlotte many, many years ago and moved to Israel in 1993. My family's here. You've actually been praying for my mom, Lorraine Postel. Uh, two days ago, she came through a four-hour surgery, and it was a very risky surgery for her age. They didn't want to do it several years ago, but they had no choice. Four-hour surgery, as she was being wheeled out of the recovery room, she had a big smile on her face, and she's already talking about bagels, lox, and cream cheese. <laughs> so just really want to thank you for praying for my mom, uh, and she loves you, and she appreciates you, and thank you so much. I also send greetings from my family, who right now we're actually spread out across the world. So my wife and two sons are in Israel. Um, we serve at Israel College of the Bible, one for Israel. If you look at our YouTube videos, one for Israel. And my daughter just landed in Vietnam, and so she's going to be in Vietnam for about a month and a half. It's kind of a crazy thing. We really are spread out all over the world. But it is a joy to be here, and I always feel like I'm coming home uh, just to see Pastor Frank and Darla and the amazing people here at, at Freedom Bible Church. So this morning, uh, I would like to speak to you about the importance of the Old Testament. Now, I know that you know this. I know that you know this, and, and I'm already kind of letting you know that this is not going to be your normal sermon. What I hope to do today is to try to get you to think about the gospel of Matthew much like you'd watch a movie. Now, I know that we're, we're a movie culture, and so we know how to watch movies. And I would like to get you to think about the gospel of Matthew like a movie. And then when the movie is over, I would like us to consider what the producer wanted us to think about that movie. And I believe that this is a very important message for all of us, so just Stay tuned. And um, I want to start with a, a verse from the book of Acts, chapter 11. Sorry, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Paul had just preached a sermon in a synagogue. And it says this, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessaloniki, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Now, I know that Pastor Frank always appreciates it when people actually look at their Bibles. When he preaches a sermon, of course, he expects that you're going to check what he says. It's so important. And <clears throat> what we see here is that Paul would go to the various synagogues preaching the gospel, and there's nothing wrong, or there's no seem, Luke doesn't seem to have any problem with the fact that the people here were listening to Paul's sermon, and then they were checking to see what he was saying over against the Old Testament. And in fact, Paul uh, and Luke praises them as being noble-minded. And so I would like us to consider why the Old Testament is so important for our faith in Jesus. And so before we do that, I would like you to consider jokes. Has anybody got a good joke, a clean joke? All right, we're in Port Charlotte, we're at church, clean jokes, okay? But I'd like you to consider jokes for a second, okay? I don't know if you've ever, if you have small children, have you ever tried to tell a five-year-old a joke? You ever try it? it? Does it work? It doesn't, but have you ever thought why it doesn't work? Because it's really strange. Think about it. This five-year-old, by the time he's five years old, he understands English quite well, correct? By the time he's five years old, he understands vocabulary, he understands grammar, he understands syntax, he understands tenses. And so, in fact, when you tell a five-year-old a joke, he gets every word. He understands every word, right? But he doesn't get the joke. Why not? Why not? Because he doesn't have life's experience. Because within that joke, there are things that point him to the outside world. And so if you have a narrow world, if you have a small world, if you have a limited experience in your world, you're going to get every word, but you're not going to get the joke. I would like you to think for a moment without being disrespectful. 
that the New Testament in many ways functions like a joke. Now, it's not a joke in the sense that we mock or we laugh away its message, but what I'm trying to get you to consider is the fact that the New Testament was written to people who had read the Old Testament and understood its message. And so throughout the New Testament, the New Testament is constantly referring to, hinting at, alluding to the Old Testament, assuming that the readers catch those hints and allusions. So what we're going to do this morning is I would like to read the Gospel of Matthew with the Old Testament in mind. And what I'd like to get you to see is that the Gospel of Matthew, like many other passages in the New Testament, it functions like a joke. And so I have a very small goal in mind this morning. We're going to study the whole Gospel of Matthew in 30 minutes. Think we can do it? I'm going to speak really fast. Okay? Let me say a prayer before we continue. Father, we just ask now, God, that you would just give us grace and prepare our hearts for this message. The Gospel of Matthew is a life-changing message. I know there are people here that are hurting, lonely, empty. I know there are people here that may be depressed, people here that have gotten bad diagnoses from doctors, people here may have lost their jobs, and, and they're here not because they want to hear a fancy lecture, they don't want to hear, they want to hear you. And so I pray, God, that you would please speak to the hearts of your people. I pray, Father, that you would show up and touch our hearts through this amazing gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as you consider the way that jokes function, and as we approach the gospel of Matthew like a joke, I would like to take a little bit of a, a rabbit trail, and I'd like you to consider The Force Awakens. You say, what are you talking about? I, I confess, I remember my mother taking me to the very first Star Wars. Was it 1977? 77? Now, I, I'm afraid to ask, is there, is there anybody here who has not seen Star Wars? Okay, only a few. So, please, neighbors, explain to them what the Star Wars is about. I'll never forget sitting in Star Wars. I remember standing in line, and the line wrapped all the way around the movie theater, and I sat with my mother in, in the Star Wars, and, the, and, and I remember just being captivated by, by Star Wars, so much so that it, when it was over, we decided to sit in the seat and watch it again, even though we didn't pay for tickets, but we've asked for forgiveness. <laughs> and who here has seen this new version of Star Wars, A Force Awakens, okay? Again, maybe less people, but it's really interesting that when you watch A Force Awakens, here you have secret plans to destroy a base, and it's put in a computer, it's put in a robot, and you're looking at it, and you're thinking, wait a minute, this is the same movie told in a little bit of a different way. In fact, if you just compared both movies, put them, watch them side by side, you will find out that the storyline is the same. Luke Skywalker doesn't know who his parents are. He's special with the Force. Rey doesn't know who her parents are. She's special with the Force. There's robots that have secret plans and secret maps and secret missions, and you've got to sneak on this secret base. And I know you came to church this morning to hear about Star Wars. I get that. And you might think this is pointless, but it's not. In fact, my 10-year-old son, the way I'm teaching him to read the Bible is using those two Star Wars movies. And you say, what are you talking about? But I want you to notice that the way that the second movie functions, it functions in a way that it constantly brings you back to the first movie. And it gets you to start to consider the ways in which they're similar and the ways in which they're different. And so the first movie provides the background for helping you to understand the second movie. Are you with me? That's exactly how the Old Testament functions when we read the New Testament. And so what I would like for us to consider now is the Ma Matthew's gospel in light 
of the story of Moses. And it's much like a joke as we read through the Gospel of Matthew. The whole storyline of Matthew brings us back to the story of Moses. Now, if you could just kind of picture in your minds, if you can shut your eyes without snoring or falling asleep, I would like you to picture the Gospel of Matthew rolled out in a scroll, not a squirrel. Actually, I had a funny story. My wife's from Hong Kong. She has kind of a, an unusual accent, and I'll never forget. She was, reading the gospel, she was reading Zechariah, and at about 11 o'clock at night, I was asleep. She kept elbowing me. Seth, tell me about the flying squirrel in Zechariah. I said, Ling, I've read Zechariah many times. There are no flying squirrels. She said, I just read it, the flying squirrel. And I looked, and it was a flying scroll. She said flying squirrel. Okay. So you've got this squirrel laid out in front of you, squirrel, scroll, and it's got three parts. Chapters one through four, the introduction to the Matthew movie. Chapters five through 25, the middle of the movie, the body of the movie. Chapters 26 through 28, it's the conclusion of the movie. And so what I would like you to do is to consider for a moment the introduction to the Matthew movie, and let's see if you get the joke. Matthew 1 through 4. Now, Matthew chapter 1 is a genealogy. It's a genealogy. But the very first words of Matthew's book starts like this. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, what you might miss is the joke here. This subtle allusion... To Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, which is exactly the same words that start the genealogy of Adam. And so the Torah, the first five books of Moses, begin with genealogies. And you wonder, well, that's boring. Why do I want genealogies? Well, the genealogies are important because the story of the Torah is how God chooses the seed of the woman to crush the serpent and bring redemption. Because it's the seed of the woman, you want to track the genealogies. They're very important. And these genealogies lead us to Abraham and lead us to the tribe of Judah. So chapter 1 of Matthew's gospel begins just like the Torah. In chapter 2, it's really interesting. In Matthew chapter 2, you've got a story of the birth of Jesus and you've got this wicked king who's trying to stop the birth of Jesus, and he ends up killing all children two years and younger. Now, does that sound at all familiar with a story in the Old Testament? Do you remember Pharaoh who tried to kill all the children? Do you remember that? And then in the midst of Pharaoh trying to stop the plans of God, a savior was born, Moses. You remember that, right? Well, in this whole context of Herod trying to kill Jesus, any reader that's familiar with Moses would say, of course, Jesus is just like Moses. And remarkably, in chapter 2, verse 15, we find out that Jesus has to go to Egypt. Why does he have to go to Egypt? Because God needs to bring him up out of Egypt to fulfill scripture. So in chapter 2, Jesus comes up out of Egypt. Well, in chapter 3 of Matthew, suddenly we have a narrative, a story about water. John the Baptist shows up at the Jordan River, and Jesus has to go through the waters of his baptism. So Jesus comes, chapter 2, out of Egypt, through the waters of his baptism in chapter 3, and you say, well, Seth, that's just a dink. I know the story of Israel. That's just a coincidence. But what happens in chapter 4? Jesus comes out of Egypt in chapter 2, through the waters in chapter 3, and in chapter 4, he's led out into the wilderness to be tested 40 days and 40 nights. And he goes without food for 40 days and 40 nights. And so what you have here, very interesting. God brings Moses and Israel into the wilderness to be tested. 
Like Moses, Jesus goes 40 days and 40 nights without food. And unlike Israel, Jesus passes all of his temptations and trials with flying colors. That is the introduction to Matthew. And so already in our minds, we're starting to compare Jesus with another amazing redeemer, Moses. And you say, Seth, it's still a coincidence. This just cannot be. Well, I want you to think now as we enter into Matthew chapter 5, we've left the introduction. And in Matthew chapter 5, we begin the whole middle of the book, the middle of the book where Jesus is not only presented as a redeemer, he's presented as a teacher. And he has five series of large discourses. They're called the discourses of Matthew or the discourses of Jesus. And they have five of them in the book, five of them. And what's really interesting, so Jesus comes out of Egypt, chapter 2, through the waters, chapter 3, into the wilderness in chapter 4 to be tested. And then in chapter 5, what does Jesus do? He goes up a mountain. He brings his disciples and he gives them his teachings. Notice Matthew 5, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. Can you see that this is not a coincidence? We would never get this joke. We would never see the implications of who Jesus is without being aware of the Moses movie. Are you following Star Wars, Force Awakens? Now, I want you to notice that Jesus has five discourses. Five discourses, starting in chapter 5 and all the way to 25. And each discourse, each time he finishes this large body of teachings, it always ends with the same statement. Jesus finished these words. Matthew 7, 28, when Jesus finished giving these instructions, Matthew 11, 1, when Jesus finished these parables, Matthew 13, 53, when Jesus finished these words, Matthew 19, 1, and then when Jesus finished all these words, Matthew 26, 1, which is word for word how Moses finishes his teachings in Deuteronomy 31, verse 1, when Moses finished all these words. And so as Matthew presents Jesus giving us his law, giving us his teachings. We can't but help but feel like we are at Mount Sinai. We're at the foot of the Mount of God, and we are receiving the words of God. Jesus is a savior. Jesus is a redeemer, but Jesus is also a lawgiver. Now, I want you to notice then we come to the conclusion of the book. The conclusion of the book. Now, if you remember, when Moses went up the mountain in Exodus chapter 24, he went, or so he went up the mountain in Exodus 19, and he received the law of God to give to the people. Do you remember in Exodus 24 how it finished? Moses, after he gives the law, he makes a covenant with his people. He makes a covenant with his people. Remarkably, in Matthew 26, in Matthew 26, in the conclusion of the book, Jesus now sits with his 12 apostles, much like the 12 tribes, and he makes a new covenant. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for, for the forgiveness of sins. But I say you, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the, that day when I drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. Remarkably, Jesus' words are almost identical to Moses' words at the foot of Mount Sinai. In Exodus 24, verse 8, 
when Moses was making the old covenant with the people of Israel. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And suddenly we see Jesus is not only a redeemer. Jesus is not only a lawgiver. Jesus is a covenant maker. But this is not the old covenant. This is the new covenant which God is making through the blood of Jesus. Remarkably, the gospel of Matthew ends Jesus having died on the cross, his blood being poured out for his people, he's buried, he conquers death by rising from the grave, and then he stands once again on a mountain. But this time, he tells his disciples, go out, he's standing in Israel, and he says, go out into all the world, all the world. Notice, he says, In 28, 18 through 20, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. I want you to notice in Deuteronomy 34, verse one through four, Moses is also standing on a mountain, but In a mirror image, he's outside of the land of Israel, calling Israel to look in and to conquer one land. But now Jesus, at the end of his gospel, this new Moses, this greater than Moses, looks upon the whole world. I wonder if he saw poor Charlotte. Did he see poor Charlotte 1986? Probably. Who was here before 1986? Do you remember poor Charlotte 1986? A hot night in Port Charlotte in 1986 was when the Coke machine was working. It was pretty bad, folks. But I want you to notice, here we have Jesus looking at the whole world. Now, let's go back to Star Wars Force Awakens. I'm sorry, for those of you who could care less, that's okay. Just see the movies to learn to read the Bible. Okay? That's all I'm asking you to do. When when you have these kinds of parallels, when you start to see, hey, these stories are similar, something in your head starts to go and you say, but wait a minute, not exactly the same. And then you start to compare the differences. And you start to get insights, not just in the way that they're similar, but in the way that they're different. And I want you to show, I want to emphasize that really the punchline of the gospel of Matthew is not necessarily in the way that Jesus is like Moses, but in the way that he's different. To notice something remarkable in Matthew 5, verses 1 through 2. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. And then he goes on in verses 21 through 22. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But, but, I say to you. Now, at this point, if you're an avid Torah movie expert, you'd say, wait a minute. Something just happened. The analogy between Moses and Jesus broke down because when Jesus, when Moses brought the people of Israel to Mount Sinai and he went up, whose law did he bring? God's law. But now Jesus goes up a mountain and he says, you've heard it said, but what? But I say to you, wait wait a minute, who is this man? Who is this man who speaks as God. I want you to notice how the Sermon on the Mount ends. It's shocking for those who know the Old Testament. Matthew 7, 24 through 26. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of God's and acts on them, is that what he says? Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Wait a minute. The Torah ends in Deuteronomy with a choice between receiving God's words or rejecting them. A choice between life and death. A choice, a choice between wisdom and folly. But the Sermon on the Mount ends with Jesus saying, everyone who hears these words of mine. Now, just so you realize how startling this message is, Put these words in the mouth of any Old Testament prophet. Let Moses say, all who does and keeps my words will live. Imagine Isaiah saying, anybody who builds his house on my words, what would we do with Moses? What would we do with Isaiah? We would stone them for blasphemy. Should have noticed. Remarkable passage, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Can I answer? <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. But you notice, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just a quick explanation. The word here for yoke in first century means teaching, Torah. Jesus is inviting people to discipleship. He's saying, you're tired of religion? You're tired of rules and regulations? Are you an F student in religion? Are you flunking out in religion 101? Are you sick of all the rules? Are you sick of all the regu reg regulations? Are you sick of all the false guilt? Are you sick of all the hypocrisy and the betters of thou's? Are you tired of religion? Then come to me. That's what he's saying. Take my teachings, but listen. Come to me. Could you imagine if Moses said, come to me? That would be blasphemy. How can Jesus say this? Who is this man who can say, come to me and I will give you rest? So let's talk about the punchline. Yes, Jesus is a prophet like Moses. Yes, Jesus is a redeemer like Moses. Yes, Jesus did miracles like Moses. Yes, Jesus is in some ways mo like Moses. And when we study the story of Moses, we get a picture of a future redeemer. However, Matthew 1, 22 through 23, I want you to notice an amazing prophecy. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name what? Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. The Matthew movie begins not with the name of Jesus, because his name is Jesus, but with his title, with his identity. He is who? God with us. The movie begins God with us. That's his title. Now, many times in movies... The beginning of the movie prepares you for the end of the movie. So when you look really carefully at the beginning of the movie, you look for clues at the end of the movie. Then when you finish the end of the movie, you think, ah, I remember that from the beginning of the movie. And this title, God with us, does that sound at all like anything at the end of Matthew's gospel? Remarkably, look at how the gospel ends. Matthew 28, verse 20, and behold, I'm with you always. I am with you always to the end of the age. See, Jesus is different than a teacher. He is a teacher, but he's so much more. He is God with us. I don't remember if I ever told you Irving's story. Irving was an ultra-Orthodox Jewish friend of mine. Back in the 80s, he joined a phone club. Did I ever share this story with you? 
Irving joined a phone club in the 1980s because back then there was no internet and he wanted to get out of his community. The truth be told, he wanted to meet women, right? And so he gives his name on this phone. How much time do I have? It's, I'm almost done. We're good? I get nervous here. Any thunder? Okay. So, so Irving gives his number to this phone club and the very first person who calls Irving is a 16-year-old teenage teenager who was an, an albino, interestingly enough, calls Irving. Now, Irving, he was, he was in his mid-20s. He had memorized the Torah by heart. He knew the whole thing in Hebrew. He had a photographic memory. He was brilliant, spoke many languages. And this, this 16-year-old says, hi, my name is, I don't remember his name. He says, I believe in Jesus. You need Jesus. Not the girl he was expecting. And Irving said, what are you talking about? I'm Jewish. Leave me alone. He says, Jesus is Jewish. He says, yeah, but he left. I, you know, I don't, this Jesus thing. He says, but I can show you without even using the New Testament. I can show you that Jesus is the Messiah. And so Irving said, okay, I'll take you up on that. And so every week for a year, this teenage boy would call Irving and show him another Old Testament prophecy. And every week, Irving, who knew the rabbinic interpretations by heart and knew all the refutations against the messianic interpretations, would refute everything this albino said, everything this teenager said. For an entire year, they got nowhere. Irving was more convinced than ever that Jesus is not the Messiah. A year later, in the evening, he gets the call, and Irving can tell there's something bothering this young man. His voice is trembling. He says, uh, Irving, what's the matter? Um, uh, what's the matter? He says, well, I know we made a deal about not reading the New Testament, and I know the Jewish people don't read the New Testament, but... I really feel like I need to read something to you from the New Testament. Would that be okay? Irving said, okay. He had nothing to lose. So this young 16-year-old read to Irving the Sermon on the Mount. Read to him the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through chapter 7. Read it to him. Now Irving, who knew the Torah by heart. Irving, who knew the rabbinic interpretations by heart. Irving is listening to the Sermon on the Mount on the phone, and by the end of the call, Irving not only realized that Jesus was the Messiah, Irving recognized that Jesus had to be God in the flesh. Irving became a follower of Jesus, and he's now a pastor in New Jersey. <laughs> Who'd have thought? But I want you to notice, the reason that Irving got a Force Awakens is because he saw Star Wars. Are you with me? I would love to encourage you. I would love to encourage you not to look at reading the Old Testament as a sidetrack, kind of a rabbit trail away from Jesus, but as the way to understand the riches of our faith, to understand the depth of who Jesus is and what he came to do. So what? So you're saying, Seth, what? So what? So what? Who cares? I'd like to give you two so what's, and with that, we'll conclude. First, Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus did not come to start a new religion. He did not come to start a new religion. Jesus came to give us the promised new covenant. Jesus came to fulfill scripture. Jesus came in fulfillment of all the prophets of old proclaimed. He came because of Moses and the words of Moses. And sometimes we tend to think of our faith as this brand new religion. No, we are part of a rich heritage that already started in the Garden of Eden. We read and study the Old Testament 
not to become more Jewish, but because we love Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer. Because Jesus is the hope. Because Jesus is the fulfillment to all the promises. Secondly, and this is probably even more important than the first, we must believe in Jesus as our Savior before we can follow him as our teacher. If you remember the frame around the movie, the Matthew movie, his name is Emmanuel, God with us. I will be with you to the end of the age. I want you to notice, if you got rid of Matthew 1 through 4 and Matthew 26 through 28, we would all be very, 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 very depressed. Why? Try to study the teachings of Jesus without a redeemed heart, and you will be so depressed because you will realize you feel you fall so short. Without the bookends of Matthew, we are following a religion. And then our relationship with God becomes a list of do's and don'ts that none of us can ever live up to. The Ten Commandments says don't commit adultery. Jesus says what? If you look, you've committed adultery. Whoops. (laughs) The Old Covenant, don't commit murder. New Covenant, if you hate somebody in your heart, you've committed murder. All of us here would be guilty. We'd have to spend a lifetime in prison. An eternity separated from God, we fall short. So our faith is not, it's not about being good. Our faith is not about trying to please God. Our faith is not about a list of rules and regulations because all of us fall so miserably short. In the Jewish tradition on Passover, we have a book called the Haggadah that takes us through the Passover. And one of the emphases in the Passover Haggadah, which tells the story of Israel and God and bringing Israel through Moses out of the land of of Egypt. And one of the points that's made in this Haggadah, this booklet, this Jewish liturgy, it says this, not by the hands of an angel, not by the hands of a seraph, not by the hands of a messenger, but the Holy One, blessed is he, he, sorry, the Holy One, blessed is he himself, in his own glory, redeemed the Israelites. The story of Passover is not that Moses saved the people of Israel. The story of the Passover is that God heard the cries of his people and he, through a prophet, saved Israel. The story of Matthew and the story of the new covenant and the gospel is this. I can't save myself. I am guilty. I don't live up to my standards. I don't live up to your standards. And I most certainly don't live up to God's standards. But God, Jesus, Emmanuel, wore flesh and blood to come in our places to rescue us from the slavery of sin, to bring us out of the Egypt of our old lives and to make us his people. And the beautiful thing here is you don't have to be Jewish to be the people of God because God does not have favorites. All of us through faith in Jesus are one new person, one new man. That is the gospel. Jesus didn't come to make us better people. Jesus came to redeem us and make us new creations. And that is the story of Matthew through the lens of the Old Testament. Amen? Father, thank you so much for the privilege of studying your word. I pray, God, that this sermon would encourage people to really stop and think about Jesus. Not just like Moses, but God in the flesh. I pray, God, that you'd give us a passion to read your word. I pray that you'd give us a passion to understand our faith through the lens of all of Scripture. And I pray, God, if there's somebody here that has never accepted Jesus as Savior, never has believed that Jesus died and rose again in our places, I pray that this would be the day.
I pray, Father, for those that may be discouraged today, those who are burdened by false guilt. Thank you that we come to Jesus, all of us, those who are weary and heavy laden, and we find rest. Thank you that Jesus' arms are not outstretched to stone us, but to embrace us and to give us rest. I pray, Father, if there's somebody here that's not enjoying that rest, that today would be the day. In Jesus' name, amen.